ahead and start that feature. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. It's 633. Um, so I called the May meeting of District 25 President's Council to order. Um, the Wait, first it recording. It said it was recording. Yeah, it shows yes, recording. It's recording. I pressed it. All right. Thank you. Okay, so first order of, oh, can I be made co-host so I can share the minutes and then Mirna can review them? I did. Right, let me do it again. Hold on a second. It's not letting me make you co-host. Louis, can you? I think you took my. No, yeah, I, yeah, he... I got to do it. You took he my. stole privilege. it from you. <laughs> Who See what I have to put up with, people? Be co -host? Me. Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike's already no, co-host. You already are a co-host. It doesn't let me do anything. I couldn't. There we go. iPad screen sharing. Nice. Okay. Mirna, can you see them? Yes. So do you want to go over them, Mirna, or do you want me to review them? Okay, so these are the minutes from our April meeting on April 15th for President's Council. Um, the March minutes were approved, um, motioned by Annie from 185 and seconded by Angela from 163. Um, one of our guest speakers was Elizabeth Eaton from the District 25 Team Awesome. Um, she is the instructional lead for math. Um, she went over some information in a PowerPoint, such as going about information for math night, um, math in the real world, some types of questions we can ask students, a uh, recommendation to use. Ooh. Okay, I don't know what I touched. Oops. What is this? Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I have no idea what I did here and I don't know how to make it go away. Okay, well, you're just gonna have a little bit of to read. Well, the uh, push the um, down the keyboard in the bottom right hand corner is a down arrow keyboard icon. Ah, thank you. Lewis to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, one suggestion was to use sidewalk chalk outside to draw math mats and play games. Um, she provided her email address for questions and the presentation will be available in our in the shared folder um, on the district page. Then we had the superintendent report from Dr. Mike. Um, super, the summarizing application had closed. Testing had begun for the state tests. Um, New York Kids Rise um, talked about the college savings accounts for grades K to two. That has been the city's initiative for the last few years. Um, so appreciated support for the math nights. Um, one of our students from District 25 at IS 25 created art that will be displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. April 1st to the 5th was National Assistant Principal <clears throat> Week. I'll talk about autism awareness, the eclipse, the cheer expo, um, which was uh, very successful. Uh, PS 193, opening their outdoor classroom, the district lacrosse clinic, which will include a lead league where our middle schools will be able to compete against each other. The district parent survey was sent out via notification system. So we all wanna make sure we complete that. And SCLD data, 13,000 kids completed the, the survey. And he also had a PowerPoint presentation for the various results. And our family leadership coordinator, the lovely Esther Maluto, uh, talked base about elections that the parent coordinator is there to help as well as school staff. You should look for having a nomination committee, um, specifically look for those that are graduating out. 
a flyer and invitation for elections needs to go out 10 days before need to fill the core position um, a candidate does not need to be president to win i mean to run <laughs> or win technically um parent or guardians qualify to run for a position but not grandmas or grandpas and all elections are either online or fully in person no hybrid meetings um, are allowed for the elections and a PowerPoint presentation will be available um, in the shared folder for that as well. Um, the order would be elections for PEA, PTA first, then SLT. And if you are a Title I school, you would then have a PAC um, election for chair, ultimate, alternate chair, and secretary. So those are the minutes. Does anyone have any questions, changes, suggestions? If not, if somebody could make a motion to approve the minutes and state your name and your school. Motion to approve, Annie, JHS 185. Motion to uh, approve. Second, Paifi Han, your, PS 32. Okay, thank you so much. So the minutes are approved. And I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, so the next item on the agenda, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Mike for the superintendent's report. Sure. Thanks so much, Rachel. Good evening, everyone. Hope you hope you're all doing uh, doing well. Um, I have a bunch of things to talk to you guys about tonight. Um, and Esther had asked. Um, that I can also connect with you guys about chronic absenteeism. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that in more detail towards the latter part of, uh, of my conversation with you guys today. So let me just share my screen so you guys have access to this and I'll put it into the chat as well for those of you who wanna follow along that way as well. Okay. Okay. So just a couple of uh, reminders from uh, from even previous sessions, but I like to go over this every time just to make sure that everyone has the upcoming dates. Um, the last one, just in terms of admissions, is Wednesday, June 12th. Uh, G&T upper grade offers will be released uh, for our families that may not uh, be aware for any reason. 3K offers were released on Thursday, uh, May 16th as well. So just for you guys to have that top of mind for anyone in your community that might be asking. Uh, some are rising. We do ask our, our families to keep uh, keep their eyes open if they weren't given a seat, um, uh, making sure that they're on their accounts to check the wait list to see if one opens up and becomes available. Um, we do at times we'll have families that, that were accepted and enrolled that may, uh, may choose to give up those seats, but just be mindful to keep checking on those wait lists uh, for additional seating. Um, testing reminders, uh, we have gone through our ELA and math, uh, math testing window, as well as the science window. Uh, New York State Regents testing um, is the window between the four, June 14th and the 26th. And during that window, Algebra 1, Earth Science, Living Environment, U.S. History Regents will be administered. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, we are also in the process of, and this is, is, this is a heavy testing testing time of year, um, unfortunately, for our kids. Um, but the iReady reading assessment, grades three through eight, um, that window is May 1st through June 14th. Many of our schools are just starting to do that now. Uh, we've asked them to, to hold off as much as possible towards the end of the testing window um, because of state testing that has happened in late April and the beginning of part of May. Um, Acadians reading for grades K to two, May 1st through June 14th as well, and I ready math K through eight, May 1st through June, 20, uh, June 14th. Um, we are hoping within the next couple of weeks, the vast majority of our kids will be tested um, so that I have a good idea as to how we performed relative to our goals that we set this school year. Um, evening parent-teacher conferences, unless, a, unless one of our schools uh, in the district has chosen to change their date, the last series for that is Thursday, May 23rd, for our high schools, K to 12s and six to 12s. 
Big shout out to uh, 185, uh, the Office of uh, School Foods connected with us asking if we can set up a taste testing opportunity. Uh, so 185 supported that taste testing to see whether or not uh, a couple of new food options would be added to the menu for our students. So we thank them, uh, thank our kids for uh, participating and offering feedback to the Office of School Food. Um, really very pleased about this, and I thank uh, all of our parents and certainly our CEC. Um, Bell Academy and 169 have now, uh, the name of the school has now been changed to the Paul Vallone Community Campus. Both st schools will still re keep their names um, as 169 and Bell, but the campus has now been renamed um, after our late um, former council member uh, Vallone. Uh, so we do uh, appreciate all of you guys for for your willingness to support that and certainly excited for uh, the family and the community um, for this honor that is going to be shared uh, with uh, with his family. I was able to meet with um, Ms. Vallone along with uh, her children uh, to share this news. So we're, we're happy to be able to do that for uh, for them and uh, our council member. Uh, shout out to our pre-K center. They engage in family literacy night, uh, promoting the importance of of beginning that early onset of reading, matching letters, reading stories, and more. Uh, so really happy that uh, that they've engaged in that work. Encourage all of our schools to do the same. Uh, shout out to one of our students at Bell Academy, Mar uh, Marilena, um, who was published in Stone Soup magazine uh, for poetry that she um, she had written. Um, so really excited about that and encourage her to continue to uh, to, to building as a writer and pr producing more things to be published um, in future magazines. So really excited for her and for the Bell Academy community. Um, big thanks to um, the CEC for hosting the Queen Zoo event. We had many of our children uh, and families across the district participate in this as well as our district team. Uh, so thanks to our district team for participating. Uh, and most of all, thank you to Tom, Alexandra and Jessica from the Queen Zoo for um, for supporting this event and making it a really, really nice day for our district community. Uh, May is Asian American Pacific Islanders Month, um, Heritage Month, as well as Junior, uh, Jewish American Heritage Month. Uh, so our schools are engaging in tasks and, I've and activities to really promote appreciation for both of these cultures. Um, it's also principals, uh, Principal Appreciation Day was May 1st. Uh, teacher Appreciation Week was May 6th through the 10th. Um, we also have National School Nurses Day uh, also in, uh, in May and Happy School Lunch Hero Day as well is also in May. So big shout out to those that help support our district community. Last session, I talked about the outdoor classroom at 193, but I wanna give them an additional shout out as students from the student council uh, came to the CEC to share their work um, and what it is that they had done um, as a collective community to make the outdoor classroom um, realized. You know, a lot of our push in the district is to promote uh, those take action projects and, you know, the use of the participatory budget funds. Um, and this school worked with their, not only with their building leaders and teachers, but also our parents helped support the development of this outdoor classroom. So, um, you know, they did come to our seat to the CEC meeting to share their work. Uh, we appreciate them for doing that. Um, IS 250 um, and their Youth Leadership Council um, have partnered with the 107 precinct. We're really excited about that. Um, and part of that work was really around a beautification project. Uh, so they helped the NYPD um, really support spaces, um, Playground 75, cleaned up graffiti at Cunningham Park. Uh, painted park benches um, at Tilly Park, you know, so uh, we're really, really happy about that partnership. They were even featured on ABC News for their hard work. So big shout out to them um, and the 250 uh, community for that work. We're looking forward to seeing more of that uh, in the future. Uh, the the 10, uh, 10th annual uh, Queensboro Arts Festival, we have a number of our students that were um, identified and representing their schools in the district. Um, at the Queens Museum. Uh, so we have Rosalind from PS79, Violet from 129, Ivy and Ethan from PS24, uh, Acadia from Bell Academy and Gianna from, uh, from the Pre-K Center. 
So a big shout out to them for the work that they produced um, and looking forward to having an opportunity to view it myself um, in the near future. Uh, PS209 had Arbor Day with council member Vicky Palladino. So thanks, big thanks to uh, our council member for connecting with our school um, to support the planting of seeds and trees at Bound Park. A uh, big shout out to our mothers uh, in our community. I uh, hope all of you guys had a, um, a really special day with, uh, with your family. Um, you know, it's, it's something that, that cannot go unnoticed, certainly here in the district um, for all that you do, not only as, uh, as moms, but as um, mother figures across our school. So thank you so much for what you guys do um, on behalf of your, your children, but all the children in District 25. MathCon, this is really super exciting. Big shout out to two of our students uh, from 194 and 185. Uh, they were invited to a competition in Chicago. Uh, one of our students received honorable mention for their work and another one finished third in the country um, in this competition among 650 participants that were invited. Uh, so big shout out to our kids for uh, for not only being identified to participate, but to earn those um, those merits is really terrific. So big shout out to them and to the schools that they represent. Uh, May 17th, we had a, um, a really terrific uh, event that had taken place. Um, students from the uh, civics uh, from the civics team at 22 were collaboratively with their principal along with local elected officials. Um, to have a traffic light placed in front of their school. Uh, last year, a student was hit by a car right out front of the building. Um, and because of the, um, the concern that that raised, students led the charge in reaching out to the local elected officials to have a traffic light posted right outside of the school. And on May 17th, we were able to, to have the ribbon cutting and the unveiling of this traffic light um, to hopefully create a much safer environment for our kids as they come to and from um, PS22. So big shout out to Principal Meyer, Senator Liu, uh, Assemblymember Kim, and Councilmember Ung uh, for, for supporting this work, um, and our instructional lead, Melinda Willens, for, for helping lead civics for, civics for all across our district schools. Uh, we also had, um, this past weekend, uh, students from PS193, um, were invited to attend the UFT Spring Conference uh, where our, their orchestra uh, was able to, um, to engage in, um, in playing of their instruments for a very, very large audience. So we're so proud of, the, proud of our students. They even had an opportunity to meet our chancellor uh, at the conference. So big shout out to them for that work. Okay, uh, just a couple of things, just to give you guys a little bit of an awareness. Uh, we are in the process of drafting our DCEP goals, very much like your school leadership teams should be developing their goals in their schools. Um, and many of whom will be aligning those goals to what we're talking about here at the district level. So the goals are going to be very similar to what they were last year. The one thing that we're going to be really paying a lot of attention to, especially in kindergarten through second grade, is the strategic use of decodable texts. We want to make sure that our kids are not only practicing uh, in foundations, but that they take those skills from foundations and then practice them in, uh, in texts that align with what they've learned from foundations. So what we're going to be focusing on as a school is really looking to, um, to not only implement the decodable text, but track how it impacts our learners, um, particularly with a focus on improving by 5% for all of our students, but then also looking at the uh, uh, closing that achievement gap by growing by 10% for our subgroups that have not been making uh, the same types of gains, uh, particularly citing our Hispanic, Black students with disabilities and our L learners um, as our targeted subgroups moving forward. Um, this particular goal, priority two, we're, gonna, we're still working on. Um, it will certainly be connected to our social emotional um, learning data um, as well as school survey data. This one is a T, TBA. Uh, we're going to come back to this goal uh, based on what we've learned this, this year around reducing infractions. Um, there are a few things that we have to adjust here, and I'll give you more feedback on that at a later date once we solidify this goal. 
Priority three around all students having high quality academic experience. One of the things that we learned this year uh, is that we need to continue to grow through explicit instruction across our classrooms. This tool here, and I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see, um, these are the 16 elements of explicit instruction. Uh, as laid out by Anita Archer, she is the prominent figure in, uh, in research in this area. Um, and what we've learned as we've gone through the years, this is just something that we need to pay closer attention to uh, across our schools, along with our targeted MTSS supports um, to make sure that kids across our grades, and this, this particular goal is primarily for our grades three through eight, um, it's across all grades, but we're gonna really be emphasizing the M MTSS part in grades three through eight uh, to reduce those achievement gaps and, and grow outcomes uh, by 5% across um, across the schools and 10% for our targeted subgroups. And these goals are, are much more lofty um, than what they've been in the past as I want schools to really start pushing those levels of expectations for all of our kids in District 25. Um, and in order to do that, we need to make sure that our goals are, uh, that we're stretching as much as we possibly can. Uh, our math goal uh, to promote college and career readiness um, is really going to focus on math routines and the five mathematical practices. And that I can go over at a, at a later date. It's a much longer conversation. Um, but this is really around promoting math discourse in the classroom um, and using routines to really promote that computational fluency that kids get very nimble uh, and flexible with numbers. Um, so we're going to be talking more about that. Uh, but the, the goal is that across our classrooms in District 25, we're really building math routines uh, and discourse opportunities in the classroom. Priority five, um, from, our, from our own school survey and school survey from the city, we'll wait to see what the results look like this year. Uh, but what we do know is that we need to continue to build on uh, making sure that all of our families are aware of the progress of their children. Um, we did have upwards of about 14, 15% of our families that completed our survey uh, indicate that um, that's not something that happens with the frequency that's necessary. So we're going to be looking at that um, as a district. And what we've also learned is that we need to continue to build engagement opportunities that are relational in nature. Um, I know that workshops um, can be good, but we also know that families don't always attend workshops. Uh, they will attend things that their kids are participating in. Um, I'm sure that you guys as a PTA can probably attest to some things that our families attend and some things that they don't. Um, and oftentimes the things that our families are able to attend are where our kids are connected in some way, shape or form. Um, so we didn't put a number on this yet. I'd love to get some feedback from you as, as uh, PTA presidents around, um, you know, how frequently do you want our schools to really engage in family-based events, activities, Things like First Fridays, Welcoming Wednesdays, where we're really pushing uh, reading, math, social emotional learning, and certainly all of those other you know cool events that that I know our kids love so much. But we'll love to get some feedback on that from from you guys if you could um, you know before the end of um, tonight's uh, president count president's council meeting. Uh, we're also going to continue our work around uh, chronic absenteeism. Uh, it does appear that we will be meeting our goal this year of reducing by 4%, um, or at the very least coming close to meeting that expectation. Uh, it all depends on how June winds up working out. Um, sometimes June can be a little bit of a tricky month um, as kids see the end in near. Uh, the end is coming near and same sometimes with our families that uh, can be a little bit bumpy, but our goal is to meet that 4% reduction. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means as we get into our chronic absenteeism presentation in a few minutes. Um, and lastly, just for this part around parent engagement, uh, a couple of the things that we're working on with, the, with our district leadership team is around uh, language access, uh, making sure that all of our families are being communicated with in a language that, um, that allows them to, to understand what's going on in our schools and events and so on. Uh, so this is something that we've been talking about, and I would love your feedback on this, if we can also just take a, a moment of pause to look at this. Something that we're going to be doing as a DLT is putting out a set of recommendations for all school leadership teams to reflect and kind of assess themselves using this rubric 
if everyone could just take a quick minute to look at what, what it says and then give me some feedback as to whether you think that's a good idea for us to ask all SLTs to do this um, as, a, as a team. And if any of you guys uh, are ready and, and willing, what are, wondering what your thoughts are about making this a, a district re recommendation for school leadership teams to use this tool um, to make sure that our families are all in the know. Any feedback, any thoughts, anyone? <clears throat> Having already had the privilege of seeing this in the DLT, I think it's a great tool. My one question is, how would it be tracked as far as the level of compliance versus not developed, partially developed, and fully implemented? Yeah, that, that's a, a, great, um, a great question, uh, Rachel. And that's something that I can create, take this and create a digital version of it uh, where they have to give us feedback. Um, for us to review it as a district leadership team. So here's where everyone kind of has organized themselves. Here's what they, where they feel that they are, um, you know, as teams. And certainly, you know, if we see lots of fully implemented everywhere, <laughs> it also raises a little bit of a, of a question about whether or not that in fact is, is happening. So we will need honest assessment uh, from our SLTs and, um, you know, this could be done by every member, each member maybe from a school has to complete it so we can get a view from, from varying uh, points of view and not just the building leader, uh, but the team in general. Um, but that's a really good question, but we can organize ways to, to track for sure. Any other Great. thoughts? Is this supposed to be really focused on on language? Is that what we're targeting here? Yeah. So there's for for one one of the the spaces that came up during a CEC meeting, Jennifer, was the idea that there are at times some families that don't have um, the access, you know, language wise, um, you know, in order to connect. You know, we have very few uh, of our parents that sit on SLTs in the district that that speak in language other than English. You know, for the most part, most family members, um, you know, don't necessarily speak that are on SLTs and, and PTAs and such that speak Chinese or Spanish or Korean. You know, so the goal is to kind of start bringing in more folks that, um, you know, that might not otherwise do that. You know, so part of it is about thinking around how we're communicating as, a, as schools and as a district. Yep, it's definitely sense. a struggle. I hear you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I just want to show you one more thing too that um I was thinking with the district leadership team as well to kind of get your perspectives also. And that is on this particular tool, the Office of Language Access. 
um, has a language access parent survey um, that we could also send out to get some perspectives from our families as to whether or not you know, they feel like the over the phone interpretation is um, is supporting their needs, their in in person interpretation, remote online interpretation, you know, and the documents that they receive. So as a district, one of the things that came up was just the variation between traditional and simplified um, Chinese characters. And there was a request to the Office of Language Access uh, to provide another version of what's typically added on uh, the DOE sites and even in our own translations. So that's how this all came, this kind of all came up. Um, and I think it's, it was kind of purposeful for us to start talking about it as a DLT. Um, and, you know, I know that sometimes we get surveys and, you know, parents look at them, may not look at them, but um, I think the more information we have to make better choices, the, the better for me, but I'm wondering what you guys think about putting out this kind of a survey as a recommendation for school leadership teams. Any comments? I, I think these are really good. And, you know, for my school specifically, you know, we have a very large Asian community and we don't have any real participation on the parent side for that we actually finally i'm really happy got one person on our pta um yeah. this year which is great but like what would you do if they 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 needed assistance like what would they do yeah so there there are so many resources um jennifer that are that we do have access to from the office of language access um that we can provide a variety of different interpretation services you know, to make sure that families are are supported. Um, and that clu includes as, as, as an SLT member. If there is an SLT member that spoke Spanish, we can connect with the Office of Language Access to make sure there's an interpreter there uh, to help support each of the SLT meetings. You know, so there is room to, to promote that. Um, and, you know, that our schools can can certainly offer, including the money that that all schools receive. So schools receive money for, uh, for yep. language and interpretation services. Yep. You okay. Know, so, cool. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Doctor Mike, I I uh, find that amazing because sometimes I see parents coming in into the office and we have to struggle to find someone who speaks Mandarin, who speaks Spanish, in order to like enroll them in kindergarten to satisfy the needs. Um, you know, so. It's good to hear that there is um, interpretation availability, um, yeah. but it's it's a language barrier that we have. And two nineteen, it's it's a melting, it's a melting pot, a mm -hmm. flushing for sure. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And I think the you know the um, some of the over the phone interpretation, it's as just as simple as even dialing. They have, I mean, they don't have you know this huge army of folks that are there. To, to service everyone at the same time, but they have plenty of people that pick up the phone uh, for the over the counter, uh, you know, over the phone interpretation that, you know, if someone was to come in, you just dial it up on the, you know, uh, at the, on the school phone and someone will come up from, um, you know, to support interpretation right over the phone right then and there. Uh, so those things do exist. Uh, we just need to make sure that, that, um, you know, we're, we're taking as much advantage of it as possible. On the P, PA and PT level, like when I have parents coming in and they don't speak Spanish or Mandarin or what, you know, whatever language, um, who do we call? Like, do we have access to the same numbers? Like, you know, like how can I interact with my parents who do not speak the language that we speak and want them to be involved? Yeah, Esther, I just saw you came off mute. Go ahead. So uh, I know that in the past, the translation unit now, Rachel and I have been to a meeting last year um, to do their elections at PS120, and um, we did the Spanish portion, myself, and um, we had the parent coordinator who did the Chinese portion to help because it was elections, so it was really, really long, but we, um, during the school year, they have a parent leader who helps with Spanish and uh, the parent coordinator helps with Chinese. So if you could find parent leaders in your school that can help you out, that would be great. 
Yeah, Marvin, that so good. some, let's, some of that let's too. Let's see where it, we're from the fly. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and some of that too, you know, we can certainly connect with the Office of Language Access for any other things that we might need, um, you know, to see what else they can offer. You know, we can do the, the best they can. The trouble is, like I said, you know, they only have a finite number of people that they can, you know, disseminate. <laughs> Um, so anything that we need, always making sure that we do things in, you know, well ahead of time, if, if it's something that's really needed, that's what we always encourage our schools to do. Uh, you know, so working collaboratively with, with building leaders to see what it is that, uh, is necessary. And then we can provide the supports as, as needed. Okay, perfect. Cause we have, we have everything translated in their languages, but they feel intimidated to come in to volunteer. Right. And that's where I need someone to translate or help so that way they can feel like they're at ease, like they're comfortable, like we're we're family, like I have you and, you know, you're you're here. So, um, you know, and it's so hard to pull outside help like a, a staff member or someone from the office when they're super busy and we're just doing a, you know, holiday shop and we just need to translate X, Y and Z. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Um, but you, you know, like I said, those are things that, that can definitely be supported for sure. Okay, so you guys, it sounds like we're we're kind of in agreement that this would be something worthwhile to to bring to the SLTs. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, okay. So chronic absenteeism. This you guys know is is a real um, area of concern, um, you know, across the country, certainly in the city, but certainly here in D25. Um, our biggest um, area of, of need, interestingly enough, is in our pre-K. Uh, Pre-K has nearly 50% of kids that would be deemed chronically absent uh, at this point of the year for a variety of reasons. Certainly our little ones are more susceptible to getting sick. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but then that's followed by uh, nearly 26%, over 26% of our kindergartners um, that would be deemed chronically absent at this point of the year. So I bring that up because the building blocks for our kids, especially in kindergarten, is um, you know where we're learning those foundations for, for literacy are happening in kindergarten. And if our kids aren't present, um, it makes it that much more difficult over time for our kids to catch up. So I'm gonna share with you just a couple of things that come from Attendance Works. Some of you, if you've been part of the, the um, as a president of President's Council for a while, you may have seen some of these slides before, uh, but they are good for you too, if you're having conversations with your own parents um, about this, this area of need. Um, so the federal government has identified um, chronic absenteeism as the new crisis in public education. 13% um, of the student po population, one in eight students were identified as being chronically out in 2013-14. Right now in District 25, it's upwards of 18%. Um, and we are in the top three in New York City, meaning with the lowest chronic absenteeism rate. So that means that 30 other districts in the city have higher rates of chronic absenteeism than we do. And we are above what this average rate was in 2013-14. So chronic absenteeism means that children have missed upwards of 10% of the school year or equivalent to 18 days. Now, what does that basically mean? That if a child is absent two days a month throughout the school year, um, they are likely to be identified as being a child who is chronically absent within 180 calendar days in a year. Um, and that includes both excused and unexcused absences. So parents will sometimes say, but you know, my child was sick. Doesn't that mean that it's excused? And the answer in general, yes, we want kids to be, to, you know, to not be in school when they're sick, but it doesn't count as a non, you know, as a day where they wouldn't account for them being chronically absent. So really important for, uh, for our families to know that um, each of those days counts. And what I've always said to, to, uh, to parents is that if our kids are out that amount of time throughout their elementary through middle school life, they would have been absent what's equivalent to one full school year. Um, and unfortunately, when we begin that pattern in kindergarten, 
it tends to, for some of our children, become the pattern that exists every year. And they are those children that are absent once uh, one full year by the time they get into the eighth grade. So a couple of true false statements. Uh, absenteeism, in the, absenteeism in the first month of school can predict poor attendance throughout the school year. Half the students who miss two to four days in September go on to miss nearly a month of school by the end of the school year. What do we think? True, false in the audience. True. Any other takers? So we'll, we'll hold on to that true. We'll see if Jennifer's uh, on the money for that one <laughs> in a second. By sixth grade, chronic absentee absence becomes a leading indicator that a student will drop out of high school. And then lastly, children who miss 18 or more days of the school year, two days a month, starting in kindergarten are less likely to learn, uh, learn to read by third grade and graduate from high school. And here is what the research says is, yes, that is true. Thank you, Jennifer, for that. Children who are out two to four days in September, um, you know, tend to miss nearly a month of school by the end of the school year. That's a, a, a really unbelievable statistic. Um, and yes, it is a, an indicator of children dropping out of, of high school when they are chronically out in grade six. And you had some answers on the on the chat from Annie and Lisa. Oh, okay. I didn't they see them. Oh, thank you guys. Um, sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, all of these things are true and really, really important that we that we do the best that we can to curb that. And certainly, thinking about it through the lens of of the PTA and working in collaboration with our schools, what are the things that we really want to build, um, especially in our elementary schools in the early childhood grades? You know, what do we want to what do we want to do? How do we incentivize? How do we make sure that information is out and accessible to families to make sure they understand what the results can be for our kids when they're not in uh, in school at the earliest of ages routinely? Uh, across the country, more than eight million students are missing so many days of school that they are academically at risk. Kind of talked about that being missing 10 percent or more of the year. Students are absent two days a month. Uh, during the school year, would be considered chronically out. And this is the part I just mentioned, that students were absent chronically um, in that way for um, through K to eight would miss equivalent to one year of school. In D25, right now we have over 4,300 children of the 24,230 or so children that we have in District 25 would be deemed chronically absent at this point of the year. Uh, when you think about those numbers, that is a staggering number of children that have missed upwards of at this point of the year would be 16 days of school or more um, at this point of the year. Nearly 15 percent of our kids that are uh, in District 25, no matter, they can attend every single day between now and the end of the year and would still be chronically absent at the end of the school year. So we have a significant number of our kids. Um, that are missing more school than uh, we need them to. Um, so why it matters, um, it does, no doubt has an impact um, on early reading and math skills, building of relationships, developing good attendance habits. Um, high quality preschool and kindergarten has many benefits, including you know, routines that child develop um, throughout school. Uh, and makes the make the most of early grades by encouraging children to attend every day. It's really important that we're promoting that. And what does it look like? So for children um, in general, and this stat that's in bold is our district data. Nationally, what it says for children that are uh, that miss nine or fewer days, their ability to be on grade level is 64% of children. Um, children that are at risk that miss nine or more days uh, for two consecutive years, uh, it's 43% of children. For children that are um, chronically absent, missed 18 or more days, uh, one year in kindergarten or first grade, their performance is at 41%. And children that are out uh, chronically absent kindergarten and first grade, the data goes dramatically all the way to 17% um, being on or uh, on grade level for the year. In D25, 
right now for children across grade levels that are chronically out, um, there's a 22% uh, difference in children that are on grade level versus not grade level um, in D25 when it comes to reading, when we compare both of those peer groups. And it's a 30% difference in mathematics, um, which is a very, very important reminder uh, for us at our schools. And it's important for us to continue to build um, space to improve outcomes in this regard. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our schools are doing um, to help support this. Uh, so middle school, students who miss no more than nine days of the school year, uh, stay engaged, successful, and on track for graduation. Frequent absences can be a sign that a student is losing interest in school, struggling with schoolwork, dealing with a bully, or facing some other difficulty. By sixth grade, absenteeism uh, is one of three signs that a student may drop out of high school. And by ninth grade, attendance is a better predictor of graduation rates than eighth grade test scores. So resources that are available. So every school in District 25 um, has what we refer to as a case team. Case teams responsible for developing systems and structures um, for teams to support the routine monitoring of attendance, um, develop systems and structures for uh, the monitoring of root causes, and then using that data to support chronically absent children uh, with, with social emotional learning supports, behavioral supports, um, academic supports. What some of our schools, many of our schools for that matter, have organized, they've done you know, outreach to our kids, kind of gathered data from them, opened up morning, uh, early morning programs, whether it was at, be athletic or academic, um, to really promote um, and incentivize our kids to come to school every single day. Some have developed early morning breakfast programs uh, because families were having difficulties getting our children in. Um, so there are a number of things that our schools are doing. Um, unfortunately, to date, the, the outcomes have not necessarily matched some of those efforts. So we have a lot more work to do in this area to help support our families and our kids. Um, and, you know, certainly hope with, certainly with your support of presidents of President's Council, uh, that we can think of other things that we can also do uh, to build these outcomes. Um, so on this site, there is a QR code that brings, uh, will bring you to um, a site. It's called everystudentpresent.org. And they come with a series of resources for uh, our buildings and for our parents to kind of reflect on. Um, you know, if we notice that our child is having uh, confidence issues, it gives some resources in here, uh, video clips around things that we can think about in terms of tips to support our children at home, uh, signs of stress and worry, series of things that we might see our kids going through, uh, identification of headaches or stomach aches and, um, you know, avoiding peers and such are all signs that there may be things that are going on that are preventing our children from going to the building, uh, coming to school every day, rather. Uh, and it includes a series of resources here for, you know, for families to, to reflect on, um, as well as the school. Uh, as, you know, at home, we, we have our kids, you know, for a majority of the time. Um, and what do we see at home that we can also inform our schools of um, to make sure that we're supporting them as best as possible. Um, so that's in the space of coping, uh, building confidence and coping, uh, supporting children's learning. There's another uh, site here to support kids that become frustrated with schoolwork. Um, you know, I think about my, you know, you know, my, my nephew who is a struggler in school, um, especially when it comes to reading. And, you know, it becomes very difficult for him because he knows on any given day he might be asked to read a passage uh, in the classroom. And, you know, absent those supports, it becomes very frustrating, um, you know, for for him as a learner, um, you know, and creates that space of not wanting to be in school. You know, so those are the types of things that we need to work on, certainly as at the building level, but certainly for our families, too, uh, to make sure that there is this that we're recognizing it. And we're continuing to build those supports together uh, so that our children don't build and don't create that space of frustration where they don't want to be in school on a daily basis. So there are some uh, parent resources here as well, um, you know, for us to go through. Um, effects of, of health on school attendance. You know, this is another section that I think is really important. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll hear, we'll hear fa uh, families talk to us about, um, 
you know, while my child's asthmatic and I'm really concerned about, you know, them having asthma uh, or some type of, of allergy. And, you know, that's why we do have our school nurse. We do have opportunities at the school level uh, to connect with our families around the needs that a child may have and a plan can be developed. Uh, unfortunately, at times we, we, you know, we'll hear things that I didn't want to send them to school because it was cold out and I'm worried about their asthma. Um, you know, that stuff, those are the things that we need to try to uh, help our families through and to avoid because um, all of those days add up, you know, and there's no doubt we, we, we always worry about our child's health um, and which is all the more reason to connect with our schools so that plans can be developed um, to support those next steps for them. And lastly, uh, just every student, every day, just mindset of for our buildings and creating those supports. This is a, an expectation from, um, from the city and a variety of resources here to help support our families uh, and our schools kind of moving forward when it comes to chronic absenteeism. But this is a really, really important um, space and would love to hear some of your feedback around other things that we might wanna consider uh, when we're thinking about supporting our families in this way. Um, because it is super, super, super important. And I know our schools have these meetings all the time, um, but we still have a large number of our kids not in school every single day. So any comments, any thoughts about chronic absenteeism, things that, that we should be thinking about, maybe perhaps that you don't think we are um, as, uh, as parent leaders? Dr. Mike. Yes, Mary. Dr. Mike's son. So my son has a, a, a list of medical situations that's going on and he is on the chronic absentee and I own it, you know, um, but if he can't physically come to school, there's nothing I can do. So if he went to our nurse the next day, he has a fever, there's nothing I can do, but not, you know, bring him to school. Mm -hmm. um, but what I get is like mixed information where, oh, he needs to come to school every second counts, no matter if it's for 30 minutes or a period. So what I get is more like, we need it for attendance. And it, it's not the best when my son took a test and said, oh, my, the science test and said, oh my God, I wish I was in school more and I wasn't sick because then I would know more about it. So yeah. I, it goes hand in hand. Like, you know, yeah. like, I, I don't know what to do. So listen, I mean, what, you'll never hear me say, that you know your child has to report when they're ill. Um, you'll never hear me say that. You know the 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 reality is is that you know our kids are going to get sick from time to time. Some unfortunately more so than others. Um, and you know we don't tell parents to bring your children to sick if they have the flu or they have a fever, right? Um, but there are there are many times, Myrna, and you know everyone's situation is different, right? You no, know, there's no one child that's that's chronically out that is alike there's always some some reason behind it sometimes it is about things like asthma where um there's not necessarily a child might not necessarily go be going through an asthmatic episode as much as it is that we're kind of putting the judgment already as a parent that i know that this might be a problem today so i'm going to keep he or she home you know is different from my child's got the flu or my child has woke up with a fever um, you know, those, so, you know, there, there are, there are layers to this. It's not just, you know, just send your kid in, even, even though they're ill, you know, that's not, you know, unfortunately it's not always the case. What winds up happening more, more often than not is children are out one or two days a month and parents aren't paying attention to the fact that that's happened. And then before you know it, the kid has been out for 20 plus days in the school year. And we're like, oh my God, I didn't even realize that he or she was out that much happens a really a, an awful lot of time um you know across our schools yeah like I, I had an incident today where um my child okay again he's on several different medications that will dehydrate him and he was outside and he was in the nurse's office and I was in school and I said you know give it about a period to get your color back before I sign you out and Again, he wasn't feeling good. He was nauseous and I signed him out and I was wrapping up my room because PTA president, um, I had other plans to do and a person was coming in for services and they was like, oh, well, he's here. And I was like, well, I signed him out. 
Mm. He was like, well, he's physically in the building. I'm like, well, I physically signed him out. <laughs> you want me to do? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. on the couch with the ice pack on his head, gagging. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, when so do both I of those, Yeah, both of those things can, can you know, um, you know, just because a child's in school doesn't mean that because he's here, I'm here, that I have to give services no matter what. So I get that. And I think there are special circumstances uh, and each each student is different. But I think the, the the general message, Myrna, that we have to start sending across our schools is the importance of of when we are able, we should be in school. And amongst the number of children of those 4,000 that we have, it's not all 4,000 of them that have circumstances like you right now. You know, and it's how do we continue to promote the importance of being in school every day when we are able. Um, because that, unfortunately, is not happening every day uh, for all of our kids. And it does create a space where, where um, you know, some of our children are missing school when they shouldn't be, you know. Yeah. And I think about some of our some of our kids, especially our little ones, you know, where he thinks, oh, it was raining out today, you know, and I chose to keep my child home. You know, they're five. What's the what's the big deal? It's kindergarten. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so we'll hear things like that. And those are the types of things that we want to avoid because, you know, and, and we, we, we went through this training session. I'll just give you a quick example, a training, a training session where they were teaching adults a new made up alphabet. Um, and, you know, an individual got up during the share of this alphabet and came back. And when they got back, they had no clue what the presenter was talking about. Now picture that for our kids that are learning all of their their letters, their letter sounds, the blends, and they they miss those days. It's much harder for them to start figuring the figuring that out um, to play the catch up game when they miss things. You know, much like an adult who missed a a made up alphabet just to kind of prove a point. What happens, and that's what happens to us even as adults. You know, so it's it's important that our that our kids are there on a on a routine basis when they can be. Yeah, of course. Yeah, same thing. You no, know? yeah. Any other uh, other comments about chronic absenteeism? Things that we should be thinking about. Um, you know, how how we're organizing or supporting our kids in a different way. This is Rachel. Um, Hi, Rachel. I think from a personal perspective. Um, having both an elementary student and a middle school student. With my elementary student, it's kind of easy to know when she's really sick, you know, keeping her home, if she's had stomach issues for 24 hours, things of that nature, it's kind of cut and dry. When it comes to my middle schooler, however, um, and I see the statistics as how it relates to um, <laughs> completing high school, high school graduation, yeah. things of that nature. It's harder because the lack of specific symptoms, so to speak, are not there. You know, the complaining of a headache or a stomach ache and knowing when it's, I don't know if you want to say psychosomatic or it's symptomatic of a different kind of issue as was mentioned in some of that the um, resources you mentioned about whether it's um, result of bullying or lack of confidence and I think that that's something that as middle school parents could be focused on a little bit more and more resources geared towards that because mm -hmm. I feel like obviously yes we want to concentrate on the younger learners and how much they're missing but the same thing goes is, is true for our middle schoolers and it's just as impactful and it's not as easy to know when they're really sick, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't trust my seventh grader. <laughs> <laughs> I've told them flat out, unless you have a fever or I see, you know, physical evidence that you're sick, you're going to school. And... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure yeah, I'm not no, the only I get parent it. out there I get that it, yeah. faces that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, listen, and, and I think, you know, on, on the opposite side of that, too, you'll have, you'll have some that say, all right, just stay home. You know, so we, we, run, the, we, we run both sides of that, um, you know, unfortunately, that, 
you know, for those that, you know what, you're not showing me any reason to stay home, you're going to school. Uh, whereas others that, you know, all right, I get it, just stay home today because they don't want to deal with the 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 hour or so of the the back and forth with mom or dad that you have to go to school. So because of that, it's like, all right, whatever, just stay home. You know, and, you know, in the end, there's, like I said, there's so many uh, variables that play a role here um, that, you know, we have to just continue to to support. But I think, you know, collectively, even be- with the, the, the PA, PTAs, is um, kind of working on right at the very beginning of the year, what is it that we want to establish, right, with all of our families, making sure that everyone knows that the importance of coming to school, because not everyone knows these stats, um, and the impact, even though we've shared it many, many times, um, you know, there's sometimes just a lack of awareness that, oh, I didn't realize that my kid was out, you know, four days already this month in September, you know, um, and, and kind of building from there in terms of what the longer term impacts of that are. Now, does it happen to every kid? No, some kids are able to push through. Um, but children that might be struggling readers, it's, it takes them extra long to figure things out. Um, and when they're not in school, it's harder for them to do that, which will reduce the confidence level by the time they get into third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And if you're not really reading well when you're in middle school, it's hard. It's hard, you know, for our kids. So we want to make sure that we're we're reducing these um, these levels as much as we can uh, to support our kids in school. So as we're going through the remainder of this year and Perhaps when we meet in June, if you guys have any recommendations or suggestions, even, you know, for me, for things that you believe would be great if all of our schools did at the start of the year, um, you know, we can put it out there as a recommendation for all of our buildings. Okay. Um, Back to my, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. So what do I do? I have two kids on opposite side of the world. Okay. So I have one kid in high school, ninth grade, East West one kid in 219 of course you know um my 219 is the one that's chronically absent but when he's in school he busts his butt he tries to catch up and he's been doing fantastic catching up right being delayed and everything then I have my um child in high school who is in school every day who's only missed two days out of the year physically and emotionally checked out you know, so what do you do for a student who just, you know, and I know this is being recorded and everyone's going to hear, but I know a parent is going through. The, the idea of being checked out with the school. I mean, there are a lot of things that happened in between that space. I'm not sure what their relationship is with uh, with building leadership and how they connect with, the, with the school leader. Hormones. I think it's just him being a teenager. So what do you do when someone's in ninth grade? That's yeah. 15 years old. You know, like that's something new for a lot of parents. Yeah, listen, I, I mean, my, my, my daughter is in, in ninth grade and, you know, um, you know, I, I'm fortunate that when it comes to her, you know, she is the kid that, you know, is going to give you her best effort. You know, yeah. um, I don't have to worry about whether or not she's going to try really hard. She might not always get there. But I will never have a doubt that she's going to try really hard. Yes. My son, on the other hand, is a is a seventh grader, um, and you know I, I refer to they're, they're so very different, <laughs> so very different, very much like what you just descri- described about your own your own two. And he doesn't necessarily put forth the effort. And you know what I, what I do know is that you know it, it is very much on us as parents and how we're organizing. Um, at home and what we're allowing to happen or not, you know, a lot of the one of some of the reasons that that um, I struggle more with Matthew is because even as a parent, you know, um, I've been an educator for for 26 years and uh, you know I've gone through uh, many degrees. I have my doctorate in education and I struggle too, just a, as a parent as well at times because some of the things that I would preach, I'm not necessarily the best at with my own with my own kids at times. You know, uh, and a lot of that's around rules and and uh, the organization of of our expectations for our own children and how they are going to to move forward with their work, 
and what their expectations are. But that's the side of the parent that's important. But the other side is how are we connecting with our counselors? You know, do they have a relationship with the counselor uh, in the school? I think that's that's something that all of our families need to connect with if they're not already for a child that might be struggling. Uh, but connecting with our with our counselor is really super important. If it's not the counselor, who on the staff? The kids always have someone that they go to uh, that they really connect with. And, you know, I would want to know who that person is um, on staff that they really just really, for whatever reason, value. Um, and you know what? I can go and talk to him or her any day, and I just feel really good. Um, you know, so I would want to know who that is um, at the school uh, to really start working on a plan of action to get that that child really back and connected at the school level. Yeah, agree. He's really connected to his dean, but it's just um for some reason he just emotionally checks out. Um, but yes, you know I'm glad I'm not the only parent that's feeling this because <laughs> you know you have parent guilt. You're like I'm on the PTA. Mm -hmm. You should know better. I'm on this. I'm on that. And um, I'm I'm really grateful to hear that I am not the only one struggling with this. And that's why oh, I love Myrna, I, I'm an acting superintendent for, for a district of 24,000 kids. And, you know, I, I have my I have my own. And sometimes, yeah, you got to, you know, the, the things, the decisions that we make, we always question whether or not it was the best one, right one. It's, you know, that that's yeah. that's unfortunately our sad reality <laughs> of going through, <laughs> of through course, parenting, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm glad we can help. I, I, would, I would work. I would work on on with the dean, but there's a reason why he is struggling, um, in um in his classes and why he's checking out in his classes. It's not just because um you know he doesn't want to go to school. It's because there are things happening that he is not really too fond of in the classroom, which is why when he goes there, he's like, I don't want to do this. Uh, so okay. part of that's got to yeah. be a a collaboration between the dean and um you know, the, between the dean and um, and the child so that he can figure out why is it that when you go to this class, you're checking out, what is it? And he'll he'll yeah. be able to say, he'll know there's uh, a what comment, that reason is. Dr. Mike, there's a comment in the in the chat from um, 169, Lisette. Oh yeah, Lisette, that's awesome. And you know what we did offer and we can, we can open up more of a space for that. And uh, we did offer a, a series on executive functioning, which is pretty much exactly what you're talking about here. Um, helping us as parents get organized, establish those routines in our school, in our homes, uh, as well as establishing those routines with our children when they go to school. Uh, but yeah, we can continue to offer that. Um, we can uh, ask yeah, Wayne I wish to I could, come back. Yeah, we can have Wayne come back and and share those and support any of our schools. Uh, you know, for you know, for that matter, in this respect, you know, because it is it is hard. Parenting's hard. You know, it's not an easy thing. She said, oh, yeah, Wing was a guest at Bell Academy. So she said that was great. Yeah, we can definitely have her have her do that for sure. But I mean, also as a PAPTA, since we are President's Council, your PAPTA can go ahead and, um, you know, if you think this is an important topic, um, you know, invite some of our district leaders to your meetings. It does, you know, there's only like Wing, there, she's only one. But I'm pretty sure if you were to invite her with plenty of time, she will uh, put it in her schedule. And, you know, if if your meetings are online, um, great, whatever, you know, we'll try to make um, wherever she's invited to support her also. We have been to some PAPTAs with um, Wing and some of our schools also. So um, that is available. I mean, but then, yeah. you know, you could also speak to your guidance counselor and your principal. You know, we heard this at President's Council. The superintendent spoke about this. What is your suggestion and who in-house could we go to as a point person that we or the parents at our school can have as somebody to talk to when we're going through, you know, the situation? Yeah, 100 percent, especially if you yeah. feel like, you know what, I'm not I'm not I don't feel good about the, the you know, the the choices that I, I'm making as a parent, you know, um, you know, what, what are some of those resources? Because we have them, you know, and, and that one just as the executive functioning as an example but all of our schools have counselors or social workers to help support in this, in this way and offer some of these resources. Um, yeah, so I encourage you. That's a great point, Esther. Yeah, that, that's good to know because we've had meetings, ongoing meetings with everyone but the principal. So it's good to know that I can just like reel, you know, Mr. Cromwell in and say, hey, this is what's going on with your student. 
and let's get it checked out. Like, let's fix it. You know, he's a hundred percent. You know, if if you don't feel good about it, bad student on record, he's been a really good student. You know, given from sixth grade to ninth, and now it's just it dips. So I'm glad that I can thank you. There, there, there are likely some underlying things that are happening there. It's not, it's not easy being a teenager, um, at all. You know, so there are a variety of things that could be happening aside from being disinterested in some of the content in the classroom. There might be reasons in the class that is also why he doesn't want to come or why he's checked out. You know, there, you know, being a teenager is not easy. So, yeah. you know, a lot of that can can most definitely be supported by counselors, social workers. And if you're not getting the feedback necessary there, it's AP's principles. Absolutely. OK, good to know. Good to know. Sure. Thank you. Sorry. Move on. <laughs> no, not at all. It, it turned out to be a really good conversation. Uh, but, yeah, anything else with with uh, attendance, chronic absenteeism? You know, please let me know any of your thoughts. I, you know, when we come back in in June, would love to get your perspectives. I will have by then um, a DLT recommended tool that I'm going to share with you guys too, so you know what it is. Um, in regards to what we're going to ask all of our school leadership teams to do. Um, Dr. Mike, but June yeah, please share your perspectives. Oh, June then I'm kidding, election. not June. I'm just kidding. No, it won't I happen mean, in June. It'll happen after that. Then. <laughs> no, if we finish early, we can definitely. Um... But just wanted to throw it out there. Our June meeting yep. is our elections. Yep. Sorry. The following we would one rather have you. Have we would rather have you present, but uh, to be in compliance, we need to have the election. Elections, it is then. Yes. All right, guys. That that concludes my uh, my portion, and we'll we'll be on for anything else that you need. Thank you, Dr. Thank Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you much, guys. Dr. Mike. We always appreciate your uh, participation of President's Council and all of the gems that you bring to us. Um, leaders the parent leaders in district 25 so thank you so much thank you okay so as we come to the end of the year of the i know it's still about a month in, a, in some away but um as many of you are already going through your um elections process as esther mentioned uh, the june 10th meeting will be elections for president's council but before we can get there, we have to get through the elections at all of our District 25 schools. So I just wanted to share some brief reminders that we got from PA, uh, PTA Link. As it comes to the end of the year. So some of the reminders, um, obviously we would have already handled giving our principal notice of the election date that was due by April 1st. Um, by now, our, we should have selected a date for the nom for the elections and formed a nomination committee. The no 10 days notice is required according to Chancellor's Regs A660. Um, we can request the school's report. This ties into Dr. Mike's um, part about, um, about language services. Um, the good thing with um, their gamma system is it helps our parent coordinators to translate election materials into relevant languages. Um, it's very important as Esther mentioned in last month's meeting to select an elections platform. It has to be either all in person or all online. It cannot be a hybrid. If using Zoom, um, establish the Zoom account using the PTAs at schools.nyc.gov if you still have that. Um, select an elections chair. Um, it's often recommended, as Esther mentioned last month, to look to tap into your um, senior graduating class because they're not going to be, those parents would not be running for election because if you're running for a position, you cannot chair the elections. Um, and there's also a suggestion to troubleshoot by holding a mock election. And PAs and PTAs with one or two mandatory officer vacancies, and the mandatory officers are the president or co-president, the recording secretary or co-recording secretary, and the treasurer or co-treasurers are the three mandatory positions that you must have. You have until October 15th to hold expedited elections to fill those positions if they're not filled um, during your May, um, May elections. Can I say something really quick, uh, Rachel? Yeah. Um, it is very important that you look at your uh, 
PAPTA school bylaws to let you know what is it that your school um, has. And if you um, are either president or and co's, that means you can have an election when one person is running alone or you can have two people running together. Um, you must follow those bylaws. If you wanted to change them, you would need to amend them. Uh, amend them. So it's already late to amend them. Then you have to follow your school bylaws. So if it only states president, secretary, and recording treasurer, that means you can only have one person run for each. If you have any questions in regards to that, please do not hesitate to call or email. Thank you, Esther, for that clarification. Um, and ptalink.org has given their website as well as a virtual code, um, scan, a QR code to scan for more uh, guidance on virtual elections. Then once elections have taken place, um, well, before the transfer of records, you would need to have completed your election certification form um, and get that signed by the principal. And then that needs to be sent to Esther so she can update the SPLCI or something like that. Right. Um, so at the school level, you give them a... You sign in the form with your personal information. They enter it into, usually it's a parent coordinator that enter it into the SPLCI system. That automatically will check your school as being in compliance, meaning that you hosted your PAPTA election in the time given and that you have, um, and that you have your three mandated uh, board members, which is your president and or COLS, secretary and or COLS and uh, treasurer and or co's, um, that would totally um, get you off the list. You would totally be in compliance. Your PAPTA would be in compliance, which means that your school will be in compliance. Now, when you send me a copy, I have a copy for uh, President's Council, and then I do some entering of information. So here at the district level, we could go ahead also and check your school out of, you know, that you guys are in compliance by successfully having an election. Um, so that's why those are very important. Um, and then uh, the president, uh, the board of the president's council then takes that information. Should they ever need to call you or reach out to any school in particular, they have the information on file. Thank you, Esther. Esther, I have a question. I have a parent that um, nominated herself, but every time I call, she is not available. Like it is a disconnected phone, email, you know, return. What do I do with that? So why did you, are you taking nominations or what? Did yeah, you we took nominations and she took, she had a nomination of the treasury. Um, and she is not available. Like I tried so you to, are to email her. her. You are to email yeah. her and letting you know that when are your elections due and that if she's going to show up, yes or no. If she doesn't reply, then, you know, she needs to give you something in writing. She does not need to be present, but she has to give something in writing so that you could say, hey, we have Lewis that's running for treasurer. He cannot be here, but he left this. And a little spur. Now, if she's not answering that, then you know you need to let her know in the email that she maybe not be compliant for treasury. Like, let's say she doesn't she answer me at all. to you by a certain day so that you know that she is willing to run, that she's oh. uh, you know still willing to run, and that she needs to send you a blur or come in whatever you're doing, hybrid or in person, to go ahead and introduce herself. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now, if you email her and you called or you make notations of everything, because I could be that parent that I'll be like, well, I nominated myself and I never heard from anybody. I wanted to run. I could have won. People would have voted for me. So what you say, no, I emailed you on this date. Here's a copy. I called on this date. Your phone was disconnected. I also called this date. And also, you know, you have that as proof. Did I lose you guys? No. Oh. oh, okay. So just make sure you note, notate everything right now. 
Okay, so once all of that is done, you will schedule a transfer of records meeting with the principal, the outgoing and the incoming officers. Um, the secretary will transfer agendas, minutes, notices and bylaws to the new secretary. The treasurer will transfer all financial records to the new treasurer. And keep in mind that all records must be kept for six years, including parent contact info. And then you would want to schedule a trip to the bank to change signatories. So that would include removing anyone who is no longer um, a signatory on the account and adding those that are. Um, I'm not sure about all of the banks, but our bank requires a copy of the minutes in order to do that. Um, in the past, we've had a, um, a letter, letter signed by the principal, but what they really want to see is the minutes showing that that person, those people, individuals were elected into those positions. So you'd want to make sure to know what your bank's going to require in order to make the necessary changes um, to the bank account. And again, this meeting should be in person. Um, if it's not, then you'll need to make sure you that all of the transfers still take place and that you get the necessary signatures on the transfer of records form. So a full list here of records to be present at the to present at the meeting and to be transferred to the new board include your PA PTA bylaws, your PA PTA election certification form, which we just talked about that would be submitted to the parent coordinator and also through to Esther, your PA PTA EIN, any bank account numbers and all bank statements, all financial records such as interim reports, um, annual reports, budget reports, and you can see the financial affairs page on the ptalink.org for a list of examples of these reports. Any meeting notices, agendas, minutes, and attendance sheets from all general membership and executive board meetings. And again, these could be paper versions, or if you keep electronic versions, you would want to make sure that, that they have access to the electronic versions. Um, all P PA PTA email addresses and passwords, login information for all PA PTA accounts, keys or combinations for the PA PTA storage locations, and any PA or PTA contact lists. So that would include any emails, phone numbers that you have received from parents that are allowing, that allow you to contact them. So these are just some of the reminders for end of the year um, transitions. Um, also keep in mind that um, the annual report for treasurers is due um, by June 30th. So, and that also needs to be submitted to Esther as well so that she knows that the PAPTAs are in compliance. And the budget for the following school year for the 24-25 school year is due by your June meeting. So whatever your June meeting date is, that's the date that you would need to provide to the membership, the budget for the following year for both fundraising and expenses. Um, and examples of those reports as well can be found on ptalink.org. Um, if in case your treasures are new or not familiar with the, the reports themselves. And also uh, the Department of Education, the DOE website has a parent leaders page and that has all the information for PAPTA also. Um, I wanted to go ahead at this time. May, may I, Rachel? Yes, take over. Yeah. At this time, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for your outstanding job as we're getting close to wrapping it up for this school year. I can't thank you enough for stepping up for your school and for running your PAPTAs. Um, but as we're getting ready to uh, start the elections, I do hope and pray that a lot of you run again uh, because now you're seasoned. Now you know what's going on. So um, next year would only be better. But 
I wanted to remind you that at next our next meeting, which is our election meeting here at President's Council, we need to have eight schools to be in compliance. So please, if you are newly elected again for the new school year, please make every effort to come to the June uh, 10th President's Council meeting because we need to be in compliance. We need eight schools to have our elections. Also, remember that our meetings are open meetings. You are able to bring your new board. You could invite them so they could come learn about President's Council. But when it comes to the election, only the president gets to vote. So you could bring your new, if you ran again and you're elected again for president, you could bring your board. Everybody could log on, but only you, the president, or the designee. And if you're you're if you're the president and you can't make president's council, you want a designee Lewis to be the person, then a letter needs to be um turned into your school and to president's council by the 10th. So that way we know that instead of Rachel uh voting, it would be Lewis because he's a designee for school 2000, whatever. Um, other than that, um I Thank you again for all your work this year. Okay, thank you, Esther. Does anyone have any questions um, about end of the year wrap up for PAPTAs or President's Council? Hi, um, this is Kaifi Han from PS32. Hello. Hi, how are you? Great. Um, I on June 10th, that's also our election day. No, no, I understand what happens. So I wouldn't be able to. I mean, I, I don't know how long that's going to take, but I don't well, know if I'll be it able to. It has happened in the past. Every year we have one or two schools that are having elections. So we understand, and thanks for letting us know. Okay. And another thing is, you said that. Because we we have some new people that may be joining the board, and some of them weren't sure if they had to attend the actual um, election day meeting. We're doing nominations ahead of time, and then having the elections on that day, on on June tenth. Okay, so if you're you're having an elections and you have uh, let's say Rachel and Lewis who nominated themselves, but they can't be there. So when their position comes up and say they're running for treasurer, right? And you're going to say your nominating committee leader is going to say, now we're opening the floor for nominations for treasurer. At this time, we have Luis Latito that has self-nominated himself. However, due to work obligations, mm -hmm. he can't be here. But we have Luis Latito running for treasurer. Anybody else going once? Is somebody else going twice? The treasurer takes care of all the money. Make sure it's deposited in the bank. You kind of read the descriptions. Okay, Uh. Okay, Rachel's running too. Now we have Lewis and Rachel running for treasurer three times. Okay, the position for treasurer is now closed. We have Lewis Latino and Rachel Baltadano running for treasurer. Since Lewis, we're going to ask the, the candidates to introduce themselves. I'm going to go ahead and read a statement that Lewis left us. Oh, okay. So then I would say, uh, Lewis Latino left this statement. And then you'll read whatever he's, you know, he wrote or the person wrote down and you read it to all of your parents that are in person. Then you let the other person who is running go ahead and talk for two minutes. Make sure you time that because some parents could talk okay. more than others. So <laughs> you want to make sure everybody has an equal two minutes or, you know, whatever it is that, that you're, um, two minutes is fair. And okay. then that's it. Then you have your vote to see who would vote for what. In the case that nobody else runs and it's just Lewis and Lewis is not there, then you would close the, the position and then you would say, we only have Lewis running. I'm going to go ahead and read his statement. At okay. this time, I would need somebody to cast a vote for Lewis. So then somebody will raise their hand and say, I, Michelle Santana, cast a vote for Lewis Latino to be the treasurer for PS 2000 for the school year, ta -ta. Um, all those in favor, then everybody, you make sure you count who said all those in favor, okay? And you put okay. it in your minutes. That's how, okay. it's, that's how it's done. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Esther? Yes. Um, June 10th is also Bleeker's um, oh. National <laughs> Honor Society induction ceremony and awards night. Oh boy. Okay, so, so I have 32 and 185. Hopefully that's it and everybody else and we can meet quorum with our eight. 
We need eight people to show up. I mean, worst case, I could probably hop on with my phone, but we'll probably be muted. All right. No, I, I will let you know if we need you. And I will probably nominate you, Danny. Not going to happen. <laughs> I don't accept. <laughs> Love you. All right. I know that we have had some schools that are um have had their elections already and have successfully completed that. So to those schools, uh, thanks in advance for having your elections and um, that's it. You're done for. I mean, in court, in terms of PAPTA. Sorry, I'm just looking to um for the budget form so I can put a copy of it in the uh, uh put a link in the um chat it's in the department let me see if i find it yeah because i can open it but i can't If you just search for PA proposed budget form, um, you sh PA P uh, D. Well, I'm, I'm if I could put, put it up for you. Okay. Because I can open the document, but I can't me, find the link. May I share my screen? Let me see, but where am I? At? Hold on a second. You should be able to, your co host. Hold on a second. Let me see. Hmm. Here we go. Let me see if I could share. All right. Sharing. Can you guys see? Are you guys able to see my screen? No, we just see you. Really? How weird. Hmm. Here, let me. I have it pulled up. Let me share this my screen. So weird. So this is the form. If it's on the PTA link.org finance page. So this Wait, is go the, to the go to the DOE website. That's why. Let me see if I'll get it and put it in the in the chat. Okay. Well, this is what the form looks like. So you'd want to have the anticipated source of income with the beginning balance of July 1st. Obviously, you don't know exactly what that number is going to be, but you can get it as close to it as possible by using, you know, by balancing your checkbook, so to speak. Um, for the anticipated amounts, you can kind of go based on whatever you made current for the current um, year based on your fundraising activity reports. You have a blank page. And then you also have your anticipated expenses for um, all of the different expenses for fundraisers, for mailings, for um, school assemblies, things of that nature. And then you'll put the date proposed budget form was distributed to the members would be the date of your June meeting. And then you'd also, as soon as it's ready, you'd want to distribute it to your principal. Um, and it needs to be signed by the president and the treasurer, even though they're outgoing. And then it's also, I recommend also presenting it again in September to the parents so that they know what the budget is for the year. Um, just kind of a I don't know that it's required, but it's just kind of best practices so that people know what the budget is. So there, I put it in the chat. Whoa, why did it go so bit? Let me see. Rachel, try. I posted the link. I, see if that I, works, if you can I open it. I also just posted the link. Are you guys able to see it? 
Yes. Yeah. So that goes straight to. So, so yes, know. the same one would be presented again in September. Yes, Annie's link worked. You're welcome, Lisa. Um, Esther's link makes you sign in, so. Oh, sorry. But that's okay. Any other questions? But I wanted to share just really quick. I don't know why. Am I able to share? Are you guys see my top, my screen or no? No. It's not letting me. No, right? No. It's saying I'm blocked. I wonder why. All right. That's weird. All right. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Anything um, as we close our May meeting? Remember to be present for June. Um, we, just as with your PTAs, we will be filling positions for president or co-president, um, recording secretary or co-recording secretary, and treasurer or co-treasurers. So those three positions will um, be filled for president's council. And all you need to all you need to know is that if you are a president at your school, you're more than welcome to run a president's council. Uh, question: Nominating committee. How many people do we need? Anywhere from one to three. You want to have more so they can help. Um, I know it's really hard to get nominating committees, but two people. Remember your nominating committee. It's just going to run your elections and you want somebody else if it's online to be letting people in, making sure that, you know, whoever needs to vote is approved. I know the parent coordinator helps you with that, but oh, you can I have, have many that. One if you have a lot of people, but you don't want too many hands in the soup either. Yeah. Uh, our par I have no, no disagreement to any of this. So our power coordinator has a daughter who is in the school. So can she obviously elect herself to a position and the power coordinator? No. no. Okay. So our you power coordinator has to be completely out. So our, uh, so the parent coordinator is not the parent of that, of that child. So therefore yes. that child, she's not, she has no kids. Now a DOE employee can be part of the PAPTA, but not at your child's school. I mean, excuse me, if an employee. So say I'm the parent coordinator of PS2000 and my daughter uh -huh. goes there, I shouldn't be running for the PAPTA position. But you shouldn't be interfering with it as a parent coordinator, correct? A, you, a, The parent coordinator is your liaison. They're the ones that help to make sure that everything is you know, uh, running smoothly that you have everything that you, there are some parent coordinators that, you know, help more and more than they, you know, you don't want nobody to say that the parent coordinator is in, you know, Rachel won because Myrna's a parent coordinator and she helped her, you know, so of that's course, why we want just the parent coordinators to help you with whatever you need. You know, if you need copies of something, we'll get you the copies. You need notifications sent out. We send the notifications. You're not clear on something they usually email us and we'll get the answers for you or they call us on teams and there's you know we have a team meeting yeah of course i just want to make sure when i get uh, my nominee committee and our elected board that we're all on the same page so you know like i i just adore what we have going on in our school to 19 so yeah good luck with your elections <laughs> I mean, to everybody. Esther, a quick question. Yes, Annie. Um, in regards to like a uh, conflict of interest, um, I remember that family members cannot serve on the same board because of conflict of interest. 
but what defines as family members? Is it just husband and wife? What about well, if it's husband and wife, two husband sisters? And wife, no, husband and wife could run. Sisters could run. They cannot be on the same. They cannot. Um, if they're a parent of your school and you have a sister, a brother, whatever, you could run, but you can't have both of those people signing the check. So if I'm the sister and I'm the treasurer, we can't have the secretary who's the other sister be the signers of the check. Okay, so they just they can be on the same board. They just can't be yeah. co-signers for remember, each other. Yeah. All your parents who have a kid in the school are part of your PAPTA. The PAPTA, it's not, you know, a members only. Everybody that has a kid in your school yes. is part of your PAPTA. Okay, so okay, they just can't be co-signatories. Yes. Esther, do we have a um a template? Um, I think I saw one last year, uh, an elections template that we can share with Yeah, I could I could go ahead and send it to you, uh share it with all the PCs tomorrow. Okay. So that way for those presidents that are running again and they have an election chair that's from the nominating committee that's gonna run the elections, there's a uh, let's see what I have. Hold on. Scripts, so to speak, for them to follow. Yeah. I feel like you showed it last meeting and I like took yeah, screenshots of it. <laughs> I think it I did that's what I showed last meeting. So let me yeah. pull it if I could find it. I just want to okay. send that to my nominating committee since I honestly can't run the election and I'm thankful that I can because it sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather run for something than run the election, to be honest with you. So. Well, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to run an election. Uh, Rachel and I well, we have some crazy agree. parents who Sorry, just make sure we do everything to a T. So. Uh, Rachel and I are running a uh, PAPT election tomorrow, so... I agree with 184. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so glad I don't have to do this because this sounds like a lot. <laughs> and we, yeah, like I, could, I said, I have some parents who they will catch us if we make a mistake. So we're aware of that. <laughs> I know and you are. <laughs> they catch you. It's like, oh my God, out of all the things we've done, this is what you get us at. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. right so i'll go ahead and send that first thing in the morning or see okay. if i find it right now amazing okay. i'll just forward it to them thank you so much thank you esther all right this has been a very productive meeting um does anyone have any more questions um before we close out the meeting for may okay in that case it's 8 16 can i get a motion to adjourn the May President's Council meeting. Motion to adjourn any JHS 185. Motion Thank you, to Annie. adjourn TSMS 219, Margo Pacheco. Thank you for seconding. So it's 816 and the May meeting of President's Council is officially adjourned. So we thank you all. Have a good night. Yay. We'll see you on June 10th. Um, even if you're not running.